Thanks. Yeah. I'm so I'm I'm Ben. Um, that's Rogan. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about this tool uh, that we've um, built along with Trevor, who's in the audience here, um, for doing user interface testing. Um, and, uh, so mostly around around the idea of consistency, checking consistency. Um, and so I'm going to say a few words just about the, the background behind this project and motivation and some stuff about consistency that you probably all already know. Um, and then tell you just a tiny bit about the tool that we built. And then Rogan is going to demo um, some things that you can do with it uh, right now. And uh, then I think we'll, um, we'll go from there. So, so I thought we'd start out with um, so some motivation and, and uh, uh, motivation in the form of a quote. Sorry, I'll stop walking in front of the projector. Um, so we so we like this quote. This guy Jacob Nielsen is like a web usability guru, um, and he was called one of the uh, ten smartest people on the web at some point, um, probably after 1989, <laughs> when there were. So he's maybe like in the top 15 now. Um, yeah, so, so uh, right, the second law of thermodynamics says something like uh, a system that's uh, isolated, doesn't have any external forces on it, tends towards maximum entropy. Um, so to sort of make an analogy, I guess, uh, user interfaces when they're developed uh, and maintained in isolation without guidelines to sort of steer them, uh, they tend towards maximum inconsistency. I think that's a pretty good analogy. Oh, sorry, I said I wasn't going to step in front of this slide. All right, I'll stop pacing. So to fight the entropy, uh, we want to talk about this idea of open source user interface testing. So the user interfaces we're going to talk about are actually just web-based web user interfaces. Uh, and the tool we've developed is about um, testing web-based uh, user interfaces. Uh, HTML5 is sort of the best, but it kind of works on regular old legacy HTML also. Um, and so we want to talk about testing user interfaces for consistency mostly, but also things that you might consider style issues as well. Um, but you know, you, you, you can imagine consistency of style being important in some contexts. Um, and then also importantly, because we're here at Open Source Bridge, uh, you know, we want to build a tool, build a platform and a system and advocate for a system where the tests of this user interface um, are shared or open and the platform on which the tests uh, are written uh, and deployed uh, is an open system. Okay, so, so I kind of said this, so why we're here is we, we built this tool that, that we, that we uh, think has, um, goes some way to solving go some way to addressing these issues. Um, so we want to talk about a tool that's designed to make testing user interfaces easy, open, reusable, and, and useful, and fun and not painful. Um, maybe I could also add to this slide. Um, okay, so the tool is called 5UI, um, and uh, there's, a, there's our uh, motto and logo. Um, so if you, do, if you fall asleep for the rest of the talk, maybe this is the takeaway point. You can check a, the project out on GitHub, and, uh, and we'll be demoing it later um, so you can see how it works. Uh, so, so that's why we're here. So let me talk a little bit about consistency and inconsistency and um, issues relating to user interfaces and guidelines and so forth. So a lot of this is probably stuff that most people are familiar with. Um, so consistency and inconsistency. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of inconsistent user interfaces out there in, in the world. Um, there are a lot of inconsistent and really terrible web pages, for example. So GeoCities, AngelFire, you can all think of examples of things like this, right? Um, but even beyond those kind of uh, web, web 0.1 type websites that are, that are terrible, um, you know, now you have tons and tons and tons of WordPress sites, for example, uh, WordPress installations. 
Uh, but those WordPress installations, you know, have all kinds of different themes, have custom, you know, custom style sheets, have plugins and add-ons and all kinds of cruft and crap and and some of them are terribly inconsistent. Some of them are very consistent and very nice and friendly and usable. But it can go both ways. And just because you're developing on WordPress as a platform doesn't mean you automatically get usability and consistency for free. Um, and so we probably everybody here understands that um, you know, inconsistency can cause outrage, annoyance, frustration, loss of productivity and efficiency. And you know, here are a ton of examples of major user interface changes that were inconsistent with the previous version, right? And that's not necessarily bad, but you know, it makes a lot of people slightly uh, upset. So um, and, you know, this quote is kind of along those lines. So the, the one thing that I remember is like when, when Windows uh, XP changed to Windows Vista, you were sort of never more than like one or two clicks away in Windows Vista from an interface that was essentially straight out of Windows XP. And then you'd, you'd be in this XP land for a little while while you were fiddling with some dialogue and you click OK and whoop, you're back into Vista again. So you have this jarring, you know, inconsistent switch. And so, okay, Windows 7 to Windows 8 has the same problem, but also GNOME 2 to GNOME 3, for example. Um, and um, I want to argue also that consistency in some contexts can be really important and critical even. So this is a, this is a display from a SCADA system, so it's some kind of industrial control system. Uh, and actually a lot of these are developed in HTML, in fact. So you have this HTML-based display that an operator looks at to make sure that the power plant isn't on fire, for example. And if all those, you have all these, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of little elements that all look like this, if they're not changing in a consistent way and if they're not displayed consistently and as the user expects, um, bad things can happen. Um, so, especially when they get complex, right? So this is a, this is a, this is a power plant uh, control display. Um, and so, you know, you can imagine if the alerts and the notifications to the operator are not consistent and not what they expect to see every time, they might not realize, for example, that I think Bay 23 there, you probably can't read it, but Bay 23 is on fire. Like, would you know that by just looking at it, right? I don't know. Now, Bay 23 might be, might supposed to be on fire. I, I'm not really sure, actually. <laughs> Good. Um, Okay, so, um, so there are lots of different aspects you could, you could talk about about consistency, and different people may find various of these aspects more or less important. Visual consistency is one that's really obvious, and this is, this is sort of the problem with a lot of uh, websites from the 90s, right? Um, glaring purple background with glittery foreground that's blinking with wizards and things. Um, but you can also talk about consistency of terminology. Um, you know, so do your confirmation dialogues, do they always say OK and cancel? Or do they say other things? So they say yes and no sometimes. Well, yes to what, no to what, right? Um, and, and lots of other aspects. So fortunately, though, lots of people have thought about consistency and all the different aspects of consistency and what is important in what contexts. Uh, and there's actually a huge amount of literature about this, and in particular, um, user interface guidelines that are supposed to kind of lay down the law about what, what makes for good usability, what makes for accessible user interfaces, um, what makes, for example, for uh, intuitive and beautiful interfaces. Um, but, you know, a, a big problem, and, and, and that's great, but a problem with that is, you know, how do you act on it, right? So if I'm an application developer, so let's say I'm an iOS application developer, if I want to develop my app in a usable, accessible way and make it beautiful and intuitive, I've got to sit down and read the Apple human interface guidelines, you know, which is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. Um, and 
you know, and even assuming I do that, and I absorb all that and take it into account in my design, um, how do I actually enforce it in what I build? How, like maybe I just read it and I thought, oh yeah, that's great, and then I design something that's completely broken and unaccessible and unusable. Okay, uh, and another issue is that there's a lot of repetition, right? Don't repeat yourself. So, so actually three out of these four sets of guidelines have a uh, state essentially something like this that I'm paraphrasing. That in an interface that has uh, an input field, that input field should have a label. And some go a little bit further, some say, so the, uh, the web content accessibility guides go further and say that not only should every input field have a label, but they should be linked semantically. So this label should have a tag that links it to this input field. So that a screen reader, for example, can tell which label is associated with which input field. Okay, so there's all these guidelines, um, and there are actually a lot of tools for checking things, testing user interfaces, automating user interfaces. Uh, Selenium is kind of the big one. Um, that's the big, the big gun in the list. Uh, Wave, for example, is about web accessibility. Um, HTML lint, so it's a static analysis of HTML pages. Uh, and sort of more out there stuff like Seculi is an interesting project that does graphical user interface testing and checking um, completely based on screenshots, which is, which is kind of cool. Um, so there's all these tools, uh, and there are some other problems, but I think the big one is that there isn't a really easy way to integrate the tools with the guidelines, which is what you would really want to do in order to check and enforce consistency. Okay, so, so just, to, just to dive into the tools a little bit, a little bit deeper. Um, so Selenium, probably most people have heard of Selenium, maybe, a little bit. So, so I'll say the good part. So Selenium is a really, really powerful tool for doing browser automation. So people say things like it, it, uh, that it allows you to do unbounded browser automation. Basically, programmatically do anything with the browser that you can do by hand in order to test, uh, test your web application, for example. Um, and it's, it's essentially unlimited in its extensibility. On the other hand, it's because it's got a lot of power, uh, it's hard to use. It's painful to set up. It's painful to configure. Um, if you Google for something like Selenium user interface tests or Selenium testing or something like that, you see all kinds of blog posts with the titles like this. Selenium, is it worth the pain? And, you know, they conclude that they're still not really sure, you know, 30 hours later. Um, we at the Wikimedia Foundation use Selenium as part of our, you know, suite of testing-related tools. Um, and so uh, I'd be happy to uh, chat with people about that after this talk. Cool, yeah, thanks. I know one, one additional thing on there is it's not just about writing the tests, but maintaining them when you've made changes that lead to like, you know, differences in pixels that are differences not really so much in how people would interact with the application, but the Selenium robot doesn't necessarily know that. Mm -hmm. And so your test fails because, you know, a box moved a pixel. Right, right. So is it worth the pain? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, a lot of people use it, so in, in, it must be in some sense worth some pain, but... Uh... But I, I don't know if it's... It is, but it's not the be <laughs> yeah. It's just something to be aware of. Like, you might want to choose to make Selenium tests for things where you know this thing. I don't know. It depends on your project. We're also actually using it for parts of 5UI. There's a, a headless build that uses Selenium under the hood. So it's definitely great at what it does. Yeah, it, it's, it's great for a lot of things. Um, I, think, I think part of our thesis here is that it's not the right tool for allowing sort of web developers and people in the community to write tests to check the consistency of user interfaces. It's, uh, it's something that takes a lot of time and skill and determination to, de to deploy correctly. Um, yeah, okay, so on the other end of the spectrum, something that's super easy to use and intuitive and very comprehensive and hits the nail, you know, pretty squarely on the head is, is Wave. Um, 
So I don't know if you want to, yeah. if we have internet access here. I think we do. Yeah, so Wave is a tool. You type in your website, and it checks it uh, for web accessibility issues. And you know, it couldn't be easier, right? You just type in your web page. Now, you might wonder how you could automate that and how to get the results out of it. That's another issue. Um, but, okay, it brings up your page and it's annotated. We have like, these overlays that show different issues that it's found. Okay, so it's really easy to use. It's comprehensive in what it does. Um, on the other hand, it has, a, it has a pretty narrow focus, right? It's only about web accessibility. It's not really open. Um, I couldn't take Wave, for example, and repurpose it to do something slightly different on my uh, organization's website. Um, <laughs> So it's easy to use and it's comprehensive, but it's kind of controlled by a third party and, um, and its scope is pretty narrow. So those are kind of two extremes, easy to use, you know, but closed and, and narrow versus difficult to use and kind of unlimited potential. And there doesn't really seem to be much in between. Um, so, so I guess this, this is one of the motivations for this, for this tool that we've built. Um, so, so we built a tool that allows you to take guidelines like we were talking about before. They could be basic interface guidelines. They could be accessibility guidelines. They could be uh, your institution's style guide. They could be whatever you want. You can encode those guidelines in a, in a form that's, that's machine actionable um, that you can feed into this tool and the tool will check your website and spit out a report saying what passed, what failed. Um, so you can encode guidelines, use, use those guidelines and the tool to analyze your user interface. Um, and as Rogan said, there's, a, there's sort of a headless batch system that comes along with it uh, that is a way for you to automate the analysis of uh, many pages and spit out reports that you can feed into continuous integration system. Um, and then, uh, you know, importantly, uh, share those guidelines. So write guidelines, use them, but also share them. Right? Um, so right now the tool is, um, it consists mainly in kind of two parts. There's, the main part is the web browser extension. So there's a browser extension for Firefox and for Chrome. And uh, Rogan's going to demonstrate that. So this lets you take a rule you've encoded, plug it into the extension, and then as you're browsing through pages, it will analyze the pages and tell you uh, how they conform or not to the, to the rules you've encoded. Um, it's open source, and uh, I think I, we had this link up there already, but uh, we're on GitHub. And you can check out the repository. You can download the extensions uh, and give them a try. And uh, there's a growing collection of encoded guidelines um, that we've written to demonstrate various features uh, that are included in the repository. Um, I think Rogan will take over and show you um, a bit about how that works. Yeah, thanks. So, um, as Ben said, I'll be demonstrating the, the browser extension. Um, the, headless, the headless tool is, I would say, like very early alpha right now, um, and it's also not as conducive to a demo, so um, we'll start here and then I'd be happy to talk to anyone about the headless system or any other, you know, just, um, anything you want to talk about, find us, we'll be down in the hacker lounge. So I'm going to start out with um, a couple of very trivial uh, just kind of sample web pages just to show off um, kind of what it does. These are not meant to be aesthetically pleasing. Uh, by any means. It's because I wrote them. <laughs> so, um, this is one of them. Um, as you can see, it's plain, but it, hopefully it serves its purpose. We just wanted to, to show a couple basic accessibility uh, guidelines that have been encoded here. And if you look up in the top right corner up here, um, you'll see there's this 5UI shield icon. And it has a little four telling us that there are four violations on this page. So I'd like you all to, to take a look and um, see if you can find 
you know, just think about, like, aside from aesthetic details, what sorts of, of usability or comprehension or readability issues do you see? Uh, assuming that this is actually the correct content and we're not worried about punctuation or complete sentences. Yep. Yeah. There's, so there's there's something in there causing that space. Uh, that's one of them. Ah. Yeah. That is a good one. That's not one of the ones that we were checking for. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's an Easter egg. <laughs> <laughs> we could write that guideline later. <laughs> That would be harder. Are you right? Yeah. Or to account for. Right. So that's the second one. So there are two more. I don't remember if that's. I don't think that's one of the four that is, or one of the. I don't think yeah. there's a check. Yeah. For that so one. that that's what's right there. There's an empty href. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I know now of six issues with this page. How many did you put in? We intentionally, well, yeah, we're intentionally checking for four. We so. can't see by looking at it, but your text implies that you have some empty tags on the first input field and not the second probably. Yeah, yes. right. The right, component. correct. So let's let's take a look at the at the tools output. Um, uh, yeah, well, um, well, we can. Um, I think it'll be more fun to look at other things. Um, so this heading was, uh, according to our guidelines, that heading should have been capitalized. Um, so and I should say this is just kind of the the five UI extension interface, um, and. We would greatly love help making this interface prettier. Um, none of us are, are JavaScript or, or UI designers. Um, and there are a number of known bugs related to injecting this page and, and conflicting styles. So uh, if you can help us out there, we would love help. <laughs> so the way it works is that each, each one of these represents a guideline that was violated. As you saw, if I expand, we get a visual highlight or a visual indicator on the page of, of the elements that are at fault. Um, there's an empty href there, as we mentioned. There's an empty heading, which was found. And then if we look at that one, uh, that label, or this form or field should have a label and it does not. It looks like it does, but not semantically. Yeah, not yeah. semantically. So let's let's look at something a little more exciting. Um, let me get back to. You. Um, and this is just meant to illustrate that the um, the rules that we were showing are, are pretty short. This is one of the guidelines that was running. It's only a line or two of JavaScript, and we'll go into more detail later. So this is the the current track uh, demo website, and I'm not I don't mean to pick on track. We use track; yeah, it works great. We just notice that um, there are there are some uh, minor accessibility issues with with um, the UI. So here, there's another form that doesn't have a label, uh, so it shows up. This interesting this uh, field actually has two labels, um, so that might be. I think that indicates that clearly somebody knew that there should be a label. They care about this sort of thing. It's probably just a label that nobody's noticed. So they cared too much. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone cares. <laughs> um, the and 
looking at the labels, uh, if we dug into detail, it's hard to tell which one is the right label. So these are not all easy to solve, but they are quite difficult to, to see if you're just inspecting the page manually. And these are also the exact same guidelines, the same impl implementation we were using on the previous uh, test page. So we're not, we're not utilizing any, anything specific to a given, a given page or a given UI. They're, they're written generically, so they could apply to, to any website. So another thing we noticed on the track page is that there are uh, some aspects of the UI don't have very, very high contrast. So let me load up a different set of, um, I'll do it this way, a different set of guidelines. So this is the, the configuration page for 5UI. The Firefox interface looks almost identical. So I'm running it currently in Chrome, but uh, either one will, should work fine. So the way this works is we've loaded uh, guidelines via a URL. We'll demo that in a few minutes. And then for each set of guidelines, there's a, a glob that specifies the URL pattern that it should match. So right now, the, the basic guidelines are running on localhost and uh, the track edge wall site. So I'll take that out and add these uh, a different set of accessibility guidelines so that now those will fire. And I'll reload. And indeed, so now we're we're comparing foreground and background colors of uh, all the elements on the page, or all the textual elements on the page, to see if they they meet the W3C guidelines for uh, color difference and, and contrast, or color intensity, Is that been? color brightness and color, color difference. Yeah. Brightness. Okay. So, got flag that. Um, we scroll down there. Are, quite a few of these. And you can see that it did mark these, these comments in the footer and uh, various other places on the page. Looks like, um, well, now we can have a list out of how many, how many rules fired. Um, so there's a bunch. So we, al we also wanted to show some examples of doing kind of, uh, more complicated rules, more than just checking uh, standard DOM properties or jQuery object properties. Uh, so we threw together a, a quick sample um, of uh, checking a page to make sure that the language used is sufficiently simple for, uh, say, a, a, I'll say a basic audience. I don't know who. A first grader. <laughs> Um, pretty someone with a pretty very simple. limited vocabulary. So we implemented the the upgoer five rule check. Sean, if you're familiar with XKCD, you've probably heard of this. It's basically just checking um, the the top one thousand most common words in the English language. So um, so quickly, we have a, a bunch of text. We scan the text. We're using the, the Node.js natural library uh, piped through Browserify, so it'll run in a browser, or in this case, injected uh, JavaScript into a browser. Uh, it tokenizes the text and then run it against this check. So you can imagine doing much more sophisticated, much more useful reasoning about natural language uh, with tools like that and easily at hand. So I just wanted to demonstrate that that was possible and to show that you can have um, you, know, you can have fairly complicated dependencies for for guidelines. So if you want to pull in something very specific, if you want to uh, if you want to write guidelines with a, a certain version of jQuery, a certain version of underscore, or any of these other common libraries that we may not be providing in in the right context, then uh, you're free to do so, and it's pretty easy to do so. So, um, 
sorry, my zoom is getting messed up. I, I would say our, our primary motivation for coming to Open Source Bridge is to try and get more people motivated to, to use the tool and to get involved. So it's an open source tool. Uh, the rules that we're creating are all open source. We're encouraging anyone who creates new rules to also make them open source. So we're hoping that, that you all at least, uh, want to get involved, and I hope that we can make that as easy as possible. So uh, writing rules is fairly easy, and I know that's too small to read, but we'll, we'll go through uh, creating a rule in a second here in, in more detail. And once you've created rules, we're, um, we have a collection on GitHub. We'd like to have them contributed there. Or if anyone wants to set up another place to uh, publish and share rules, that would be fantastic. So um, I'm going to see if I can write a rule. Yeah. I think and we have like 10 minutes. So. OK, yeah, should be able to. Uh, and I, I'd, I'd love for this to be a discussion if people have uh, specific things that they'd like to see if we can do, or questions, contributions, criticisms. Uh, so let's... The battery. Okay. So, um, actually let me should give some context. Uh, um, Okay, so the rule I had in mind is um, related to Trello. Um, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with it or has used it. It's a Fog Bugs product. Um, uh, Fog Creek. Uh, Fog Creek. Thank you. The pro other product is called. Yeah, Fog Creek makes Fog Bugs Fog and Trello. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Uh, so we noticed something which, in, in one sense, is nitpicky, but uh, it did bug me. So I thought, well, let's see if we can write a rule. Uh, so a lot of the UI has this great save button, and it's accompanied by a cancel button, which is right next to it. And this shows up in quite a few places. I won't go through all of them. One of the places it doesn't show up is here. So here's a save button, but there's no cancel button. It's up here. So uh, I thought I would dig in and take a few minutes and see if we can figure out um, how to write a rule that will check this. So, uh, okay, this is, you probably will not be able to read the debugger. Um, and I can't see the bottom of my screen. Okay. <laughs> so the, the general, while I'm doing this, I'll, I'll go through the standard workflow that we have for, for writing a rule. So I'm going to start out by looking at the existing tags or um, annotations or anything on, on the widgets that we're interested in that I can use as some sort of semantic key. I, I need some way to identify that save button. So there are a number of ways we can do that. Um, perhaps the simplest way is to just figure out the X path to that button. Um, but that won't work if this is in a different window. If I, if I pull up a due date on a different a different card, that X path will get, well, will break. And it might be very complicated to write it correctly so that it would work in all cases. So instead, um, I guess you, you, wouldn't, you also wouldn't want to write a rule that only applied to one particular save button in one particular dialogue mm -hmm. and have to do it 10 different times for all the different save buttons. What I'd really like to use is something like the web accessibility uh, area role attribute with, with something like a, a submit button or a, a confirm button. Uh, but this UI isn't using that attribute, and that attribute doesn't go to quite that level of granularity. But you could imagine using something like that to do very rich semantic analysis. So that's where we'd like to be. Um, it's a ways off, but I think it's something that we could all kind of push for. In this case, uh, so we have a number of classes, and one of them is confirm. Uh, so that'll work for that. 
And we can use the jQuery selector to, to pull out everything with a, a confirm button. I'm going to actually just give it a, a shot. Interesting. So there's something hidden somewhere. If we bring this back up and run it again. OK. So that gave us the right button. Now, since I know that I want um, a, a cancel button, we'll do sort of the same thing. And that confirm should also find that save button, which indeed it does. So I can tell that by hovering over the results of the jQuery um, result. So we'll do the same thing for this cancel button, just using the inspector. And this has a, so we'll see it has a cancel class. So once again, just because I like to be absolutely sure that my jQuery selectors work, I have low confidence. <laughs> okay, so we know one is confirm, one is cancel. Uh, it looks like they're about the same height, so just given that we're short on time, we'll just uh, assume that the heights need to be the same. And we can also check the uh, X offsets to make sure that, that the confirm button is to the left of the cancel button. So let's uh, create a directory. We need to create a manifest for the set of rules. Uh, this manifest is, is a JSON file. It has a name, a description, which I'm going to leave blank. It can have a list of dependencies, but we don't need that, so um, we'll just skip it. And then finally, it has a rules list, which is a list of uh, Java, JavaScript files relative to this manifest. So the way we're going to load this is through a URL. Uh, so I've created this directory underneath the presentation we're giving, which is hosted with, uh, through a local web server. We just use Python's uh, simple HTTP. Just uh, the, the JavaScript file for a rule needs to assign th three things to a unbound exports object. So it's a little bit like uh, common JS. So those are a uh, name, a description, and a rule. Then feel free to jump in if you have any anything to add or comments. You're missing semicolons. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so the name and the, and the description are just plain strings. The rule is a, a function which takes a report object as the first parameter. That object exposes a error function. You can call that function with a string describing the problem and a DOM node um, showing where the problem was. So that DOM node is how we're able to do the highlighting we were showing earlier. Um, OK, so I said we needed to run a query. Um, uh, jQuery is in scope um, automatically for these rules. We've had to wrap the standard jQuery dollar function um, with what we're calling dollar five um, because the uh, by default, it doesn't. Uh, the jQuery function doesn't uh, cascade selectors through frames and iframes. So, if you want to run a, run a query across an entire website, which we usually did, uh, we had to write our, uh, a custom, uh, basically a custom recursor. Um, so this wraps that up. Okay, so I want all the confirm uh, elements. Now. <clears throat> we 
we'll we'll filter this. Um, so we'll, we'll get a list essentially. If we run a filter, we want to find the confirm elements that don't have a corresponding cancel. So for the filter, um, we'll just sort of do the same sort of query. these. Okay, for each cancel button we're looking for the X and Y offsets with X and Y locations. Um, just want to know the offsets. Same thing up here. You can never come up with good variable names on the spot. <coughs> uh, indentation looks off. Okay, so. We have the offsets of the submit button, we have the offsets of the cancel button. That's um, Do you know, uh, is it X, Y, top, bottom? Top and left. Top and left. Say that one's uh, left. Okay, so let's not worry about overlap uh, right now. And we want the off the left side of the submit button to be well. How about strictly less than the uh, offset of the cancel button, and that will filter out. I always forget which way. Oh, actually. Yeah, so that, that each should be a filter. And Ah, okay. So this would be... What was it? Like that? And then, uh, okay, and that'll give us a true or false. So that, this will return true if it finds something there. So we actually want to negate the logic. But we'd probably negate it up here. Right. So you're looking for a list of save buttons that have no corresponding cancel yeah, in the so right place. If there's a sum, there's probably a none. Let's just negate this song. <laughs> <No. laughs> 
Okay, so that's going to give us a list of things that are missing, um, which I'm just calling bad right now. this works, so I won't have time to debug it. Okay, so we have a list of elements, now we can report them. So I guess while we're, while Rogan is debugging, um, sort of the general pattern of a lot of these rules is is you write a function that uses jQuery to pull out stuff that you want to check. You you implement the logic of the check and then you report uh, the elements that fail the check. And so a lot of these rules are are in, in terms of amount of code pretty small. I mean thanks to jQuery mostly. Um, okay. Okay, so now I need to add that rule set. Um, Trello. Forgot to actually save the rule set. Okay, so I'm just taking the URL to that JSON file we created, pasting it into our UI for adding rules. You can see, okay, I pulled out the name, so at least that much worked. And Trello as a URL pattern is probably fine. Okay, so right now I haven't reloaded the page yet. We didn't have a rule before, so the five view icon is gray. Uh, when I reload it, it should be red. There are no submit or cancel buttons on screen, so we don't get any any errors. If we open this up, still no violations because that cancel button is in place or our rule is broken. <laughs> you, you never know. know. <laughs> <laughs> hey. hey! Excellent. Uh, I'm doesn't usually work that well. <laughs> I usually make a mistake somewhere. Um, yeah. <laughs> You're on GitHub, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, th so that's the gist of it. Um, it hopefully it's not too painful. Um, you know, hopefully you can write a rule that does what you want in the sort of situation faster than, than you could redeploy Selenium. Um, hopefully you can do a little more variety than you can with Wave and we'd love to talk to you more offline. So please let us know if you're interested. And, or just use it. Do you happen to know who's current, uh, any of the projects that are currently using it? Uh, we don't know of any right now. So we just pushed our uh, 0.3 release today, and it's, it's really brand new. Uh, we've had a couple internal releases that we've been playing with, but we're, we're very much looking for users. We're looking for feedback. Um, you know, suggestions, feature requests, bug requests, pull requests, um, and we're we're wide open right now. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.